Now, um, a very good evening to all of you. Um, I sincerely welcome all of you to today's talk by uh, Atul Kumar uh, Veach. Riviyad Atul sir to all his students at Rishi Valley School, school and my son is sitting right behind me all excited uh, to uh, hear the lecture. Uh, it is a rare opportunity to have him with us and the theme of his talk today is also very pertinent to our times. Uh, the title of the talk is Enrichment of Science Education at the School Level. And Atul has promised um, uh, me that he'll also talk about teaching. He's teaching, uh, talking about teaching science in schools, of course, of course, but he'll also talk about related issues, or so he said, including about the uh, joint entrance uh, selection process. Uh, so I'll hold him to that promise. And um, after a brief introduction, I'll step back and let a discussion for today. Uh, Manish Jain anchored the talk. Um, a little bit about this speaker, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Atul Vij is currently a teacher at Rishi Valley School in Andhra Pradesh. Um, he mainly teaches physics uh, to the senior classes of uh, uh, 10, 11, and 12. Um, he occasionally teaches wood, woodcraft to the students as well. These fall under the arts and crafts section, and he also helps students um, uh, design various models in the design section. He helps them in the process of making these uh, models. Um, he grew up uh, in Delhi and uh, completed his BTEC from IIT Delhi in the year 1993 and uh, his MS from the University of Illinois in the year 1996, both of these in uh, mechanical engineering. For uh, nearly 20 years, he worked as an engineer at Bechtel and General Electric in India in the areas of uh, systems engineering, aircraft engine combustion, and the gasification of fossil and biomass fuels. Um, in 2012, he began volunteering as a physics teacher at the Bangalore Stainer School. And in the year 2016, he moved with his family to the Rishi Valley School, where he has been teaching physics and woodcraft, as I said. Recently, he has been involved in setting up a design center at the school, which has been instrumental in enriching the science curriculum. Um, he has also encouraged many students in coming up with their own ideas of making different things, and this is a point I've already uh, made. Today's uh, discussant is our very own Manish Jain, who is the coordinator uh, for the Center for Creative Le Learning at the Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhinagar. I could not think of a better person to anchor the um, talk. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, so I, you know, after this introduction, as as I said, I'll step back and let Manish um, uh, do the anchoring. But for the moment, I welcome um, Atul sir, and maybe you should take the mic. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you all for joining us for this talk. Thank you. So I guess. Um, yeah. Wait. So we can begin. Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. All right. So, uh, well, I'm going to share my screen and, uh, you know, normally I would have uh, done this more like a demo uh, along with the talk. Uh, I like to, you know, show experiments, do things with my hands, but uh, we can't do that in this time very easily uh, over the web. So, uh, so please pardon the, you know, the slides but uh, that's the best I can do uh, over the internet. So um, uh, let's, uh, let's get started. So uh, yeah, here's- recording. I just wanted to ensure that this is getting recorded. Yes, yes, please go ahead, Atul. All right. So um, basically science enrichment is, uh, is not a new topic. Um, there is a global movement, it's a growing movement and it is growing for many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that um, uh, everybody wants more science awareness in general among the population. And that is because, uh, you know, society is becoming more technologically advanced. Uh, there's also a bigger demand for technical workforce because there are more and more uh, people needed to produce the technology uh, that we are using because we are using so much of it. And there is also another issue that is now well documented, well uh, researched that there is a gender gap in science, technology, um, engineering, and math education, and uh, and so you know so there are these reasons that science enrichment is becoming a, a movement. 
but I'm going to take a slightly different approach today. I'm not going to start with uh, you know trying to solve a problem, although we might have some clues on how it can be solved. You know these uh, issues. Uh, what I'm going to do is try and start from the very nature of science and its purposes and uh, see where it leads us. So um, I also want to you know, say right at the beginning that uh, what I'm doing today is not, um, uh, you know, not uh, in any institution's view. Uh, things that I have learned um, through my uh, rather short experience as a teacher uh, you know, four years as a volunteer, four years formally at Rishi Valley. So, so these are essentially my learnings and I'm sharing them with all of you. Uh, maybe there's something for you to uh, take from this, something that you can add to it. Okay. So, and, and I think we are all in this collaboration if we are interested in this topic. So, so that's the purpose of sharing. Okay. So I'm going to start with, uh, you know, one thing I said about uh, the nature of science. So let's see. Uh, uh, everybody believes, you know, and says this, that keen observation is fundamental to science. Okay, and what I'm going to do is ask you a very simple question. Okay, and the question is this, suppose, I, I don't know if you can still see me, but uh, suppose I take a glass, okay, a tumbler, and I take a stick, okay, and I dip it into the glass, and let's say I ask you this question, uh, if I fill this with water, what are you going to see? from the side, okay? So you're looking at this glass from the side, I fill it with half level water. What are you going to see? Okay, this is a um, sort of a trick question I do with parents and I do it with students. And very often what they tell me is that you are going to see the stick bend, okay? And uh, uh, then I ask them, you know, I, I encourage them and I ask them, okay, so it's going to bend. So in which direction will it bend, upwards or downwards? Okay. And some of them think, and uh, you know, then they say it, it bends upwards. Okay, and so, and I think um, I, I know the reason why they say this because somewhere in their mind is this picture. Okay, I, can you see this picture? I suppose you can. Yeah. So, uh, so in this picture, basically, you see a stick, and you see that it is bent and it is happening because of the refraction of light. When light goes from water to air, it bends. And when it reaches the eye, it causes a bending of the stick. Okay. But if you actually did this experiment, this is what you would see. Okay. Um, are you able to see this picture? Uh, Madhumita, can you just confirm? Because I am seeing uh, my own picture overlapping with it. Yes, or maybe yes. I can yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah. Yes, it is. So, so what you actually see is actually something like this. Okay? You actually don't see a bent stick from the side. Uh, what you see from the side is a broken stick. Okay? And if you look a little bit from the top, you do see a bent stick. So from the side, you don't see a bent stick. Okay. And, uh, um, you know, if you look at why this happened, you know, why is it that people feel that they are going to see a bent stick is because, you know, the diagram on the right side um, is not really a side view, but that's how it's been interpreted. Okay? It's actually just a ray diagram. It's, it's a diagram about the phenomena at work. It's a diagram which tells you how light goes, but the eye is actually here and the eye is looking from the top. Okay. And, um, and here, uh, you know, in the actual uh, picture, uh, you basically see this phenomenon of bending only from the top. Now, in a science class, this would be taken further and, you know, you would actually measure the real depth, the apparent depth, and you would say that for water, uh, the apparent depth is about three quarters, the real depth. And then we calculate the refractive index of water and we say it's about 1.33, okay? The, there is another phenomenon that we would then teach, you know, in physics, which would be called the lateral shift, okay, uh, which explains why there is a split. And one thing that is also happening in this particular uh, experiment is that you actually see the stick enlarged within the water, whereas outside it's actually thinner, okay. So that, of course, is happening because this is a curved beaker and so it's actually acting like a lens 
uh, the water in it is acting like the lens and it causes uh, magnification. Okay, so, so now, but think about this, the implications of this. If children are given the time to quietly observe things, they are given the leisure to observe things, they are allowed to draw three-dimensional diagrams, it can make a big difference uh, to what they capture and what stays in their memory. Okay, so I wanted to make this point because, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to now, you know, tell you that, you know, what really is the journey of science. Uh, so, um, science, I think, uh, for children, you know, for developing human beings or children, it starts with the observable and you can progress to the mathematical and then you can take it to the abstract. Now, by mathematical, I mean you can, for example, um, you know, find a ratio of the real depth to the apparent depth, and you will find that no matter what object you try, uh, uh, you know, even if you look at a coin uh, in a bucket of water, you'll always find that mathematically the apparent depth is three quarters of the real depth. Okay, so that is mathematical representation of what you've already observed. But when you want to find out the causes of this, you know, why does it happen? Then you enter the abstract world. Now, in, in this particular example, which I just showed you, um, there was in fact, uh, you know, a scientist uh, named Huygens who said that uh, this happens because of the velocity of light in the mediums. And he said that the velocity of light in water is actually less than the velocity of light in air. Later on, Newton, um, challenged this and uh, uh, he said that the velocity of light in uh, air is more, uh, sorry, air is less than the velocity of light in water, okay? So he had the opposite view. And for a good hundred years, uh, Newton's uh, view of this uh, or Newton's re you know, rationale for it or his abstract reasoning for it uh, actually was considered true till uh, people actually found ways to measure the speed of light in air and in water. And then it was found that, that Huygens was actually right. Okay, so uh, with the observable, there's very little chance that you can go wrong. Two people will no normally be able to agree. Uh, even with a mathematical representation of the observable, there is not much that can go wrong, except that if you made measurements which are in error. But in the abstract, there is a room for a lot of different interpretations. So in the theory or in the abstraction is where um, you can have different ways of, uh, of progressing. And I'll give you more examples of this. So, but it is important from you know, a student's point of view that we integrate these and we don't teach straight away the abstraction or the mathematical and that we make enough time uh, for observations. Um, let's say, uh, you know, students are given this opportunity and they could indeed become, you know, more thorough scientists, but does that make them a fuller human being is the question, because education's purpose is not limited to, you know, doing well in one particular stream. So, so there is a need to integrate, not only vertically, but also horizontally. And um, I'm mentioning music, art and craft here, but Really, uh, there can be things like poetry here. Uh, there can be other things, you know, uh, um, that 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 could be added to this horizontal dimension, which uh, they can engage with. And um, it, there are many, you know, schools of thought where you would call this the integration of the head, heart, and hands. Okay, so these are connections within uh, the human being. Uh, but is this enough? And uh, you know, my view is that not really, because there's a whole world outside uh, the human being. And again, I'm not mentioning every discipline here. Uh, there's history, geography, sociology, economics here, but then you know there could be things like psychology uh, and, and several others. And, and those are all about how the human being connects with the world. And, and I'm calling all of these uh, horizontal integration because uh, you would have to integrate at the level that the child can understand. And, and so, uh, you know, not progress too far beyond their uh, current level. And, and so, you know, uh, making these connections with the world, the, 
the intention obviously is that this should then lead to a human being who is uh, more connected uh, within and are also more connected without with the rest of the world, okay, more aware. So, so this is sort of a picture that you know you get for um, enriching a subject, and it, you know sci it doesn't have to be enrichment of science. You could take any other subject and place it at the bottom, um, and then you could put science on the side, for example. You know, for example, sociology can have can be at the bottom, and then science would be an input to it or integrated with it. So, so this is just a way of enrichment, and it is nothing that you know particularly that only science can benefit from it. Um, so I'm going to now uh, share with you many, many examples from, uh, not many, but a few at least, uh, examples uh, you know, of, uh, uh, of student work. And uh, these are uh, from a couple of sources. Uh, they belong to you know, students who I have taught. So this one is from the Bangalore Steiner School. And uh, I'm basically trying to, again, illustrate how the sensory to abstract integration can be done. So on, on the very first panel on the left, you are looking at the work of a six, class six student. Um, if you take bottles of different heights, uh, you can make sound with these bottles. Okay? It's quite easy. Um, I don't know if you have ever tried this, but if you take a bottle like this, you can blow into it and you can produce uh, uh, you know, a certain pitch of sound. And uh, and if you took a shorter and shorter uh, bottle till the point came that you are actually dealing with, let's say, just a pen uh, cover, you know, you will be making more and more shrill sounds. And so obviously a child can understand very easily that um, as you decrease the size of the bottle, uh, the pitch increases. And interestingly, um, you can do this experiment not only with bottles, you can do it with um, wind chimes. Uh, pipes, you can do it with strings. And in all cases, uh, you know, the child discovers that um, that as the length decreases, the pitch increases, the pitch of sound. And you can go a little deeper and, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can, for example, do the second experiment here, which is again in class six, where what has been done is that there is a bigger bottle and it's filled with water. Uh, it's filled with water to become equal in length in terms of its air column to another empty bottle. So this bottle is empty and this one is you know, partly filled with water and it's done in such a way that the air column lengths are the same. And it so happens that when you make sound with both these bottles, uh, they give the same pitch and the human ear is, is quite good at determining the pitch um, uh, you know, in qualitatively. And, and so uh, the conclusion from this very simple experiment is that it's the air column's length and not the size of the bottle, which is making a difference. Okay, so the pitch is related to how much air or what height of air there is. In fact, you can carry forward this experiment with various shapes of bottles and it turns out that the shape doesn't matter so much. What really matters is the height of this air column. Now that's, uh, that's very sensory, obviously. It's an observation thing. Uh, you proceed to class seven and you can integrate some math lessons with this. So in this particular case, uh, uh, what I did was I took a bottle and uh, I marked it off at these intervals, okay? And uh, successively filled water to various levels in eight different bottles. And when you do that, you get actually the notes of the octave. Okay. So you get sare, gamma, padha, nisa, and this is the higher octave. Okay. So you get this and you have to divide this bottle's length uh, in these ratios. So these fractions have to be used. Notice that they're not equally spread out. Okay. They're not equally spread out. And uh, when you do this with children, they can immediately, especially if they are learning music in the school, they can very quickly see that you've got the octave notes and you've got them um, by using certain magical fractions. At that age, it could appear magical. Why is it that this you know, set of fractions leads to, to this octave? Uh, incidentally, the higher pitch saw is obtained at exactly half 
the height as the uh, the prime sub. Okay, so all this can be observed by children, and and um, normally we leave it at that. It's only in class eight that we introduce something theoretical about sound. Uh, up to class seven, there is really no mention uh, that I made of uh, of frequency or waves of sound. That terminology wasn't used at all. Okay, um, in class eight, um, this time we had a huge tube uh, about one point, uh, you know, one point three, one point five meters long, and again we were able to fill it with water. And this time there was a tuning fork at the top, which um, when you fill this tube with water to various levels, you know, you can keep filling it up slowly. And at some intervals, um, it sounds really loud. Okay? And uh, it's called a resonance tube for that reason, uh, because the tuning fork sound starts resonating with this tube. But it doesn't happen at any arbitrary length. Uh, in this particular example, it happened when the tube was, you know, the water was at 130 centimeters, which means the water is below, okay? When you raise the water to 88 centimeters, again, the tube sounds very loud. In between 88 and 53, again, it doesn't sound loud, but at 53, again, it sounds loud. And then at 18 centimeters, again, it sounds loud. Now, if you take these numbers and you divide by the smallest of them, okay, so 130 divided by 18, you get seven. 88 divided by 18, you get five. 53 by 18, you get three, and 18 by 18 is one. And, and you suddenly notice there's a pattern here. These are the odd numbers, one, three, five, and seven, okay? And, and there's a pattern. There's something strange, something that is happening here. And you can then proceed to teach children um, the wave theory of sound. You can tell them why there must be an odd number of full, uh, of half wavelengths that have to fit in this tube, okay? Because there is what we call a node here and an anti-node here, okay? And so the amplitude has to be high at the top, but it has to be zero for the vibrations of sound at the bottom. So, so then you can explain to them why these ratios happen. So now what the child has learned is a little bit of abstract theory, something they can't see, but they know now that sound is some sort of a wave. And they also know uh, that the wavelength is proportional to the length, okay? And the frequency is inversely proportional to the length of the air column. Okay, so there is a very clear mathematical relationship between uh, you know, the, the pitch and the length which you get. Now, this can be even further enriched. You can um, work with children uh, and their craft teacher. If there is a craft teacher, then you can make flutes. And again, when you design a flute, you, you have to remember that the holes in the flute are not equally spaced. There will be variations in the spacing, then you can work out the spacings and you can make a very accurate flute. So that sort of an integration opportunity exists uh, even at the middle school level. Now let's say um, uh, you, know, you have a class 11 student okay, and this is uh, from Rishi Valley. So, uh, now, remember that this child already has, uh, you know, a background in the theory of sound. And they know that there is a resonance uh, phenomenon in sound. And they also know that uh, even for plates, pipes, all sorts of objects, there is something called a natural frequency at which it starts vibrating um, uh, with a high amplitude. Okay? And we say that it is uh, its natural frequency. If this happens to bridges. It happens to tuning forks. It happens to plates also. So this one is a square plate, okay? And uh, this student has very carefully mounted the plate on top of a speaker. And then there is a cone here. And then there is a vertical uh, support for the plate. So it's suspended only at the center, okay? The center of the square. And to the speaker, uh, we are feeding, uh, you know, signals um, of various frequencies. And at some frequencies, the plate uh, begins to vibrate much more uh, vigorously than at other frequencies. Okay? And if you sprinkle some um, rye seeds uh, on the top, uh, you know, you'd have to experiment with what kind of things you want to sprinkle on top. You can start with sand, you can try various kinds of seeds. And at some point you will find that it's, 
it's possible to now obtain beautiful patterns um, depending on you know where the tube is uh, sorry the plate is um, is vibrating more vigorously and where it is at rest so these seeds basically tend to come to uh, rest where the where the plate is not moving okay at the so called nodes of uh, vibration and in between are the anti nodes so this is a much more complex uh, vibration than we saw in the previous slide but you know we won't even teach this level of two dimensional vibration in school but what has happened here is that just by knowing the fundamental nature of sound and vibrations uh, this student has done a, an integration from the abstract to the sensory it's created something uh, which is very visual very sensory and uh, it's been created because the fundamentals of sound uh, you know were clear or are understood so so this sort of integration is also possible and it's very enriching um i'm going to offer some examples now of horizontal integration but um, really there is no um, um hard and fast rule uh, many examples of horizontal and vertical integration happen together um if a teacher is alert and creative uh, you just look for them you find them uh, so it's not necessary that you know these are only examples of horizontal integration there can be both together so uh, i'm giving you you know one more example uh, which is also in the realm of sound uh, this time uh, this student made a xylophone okay now for a xylophone you have uh, these tubes of different lengths okay and uh, the longest one is here and then there's a shorter one here uh, you can notice again there are eight and again that's because we are trying to produce the octave so when uh, you know when you make this sort of a musical instrument it's it's a, a sort of a craft project uh, you place these tubes on top of a stand and then you realize that the, when you try to make sound you know you use use this to strike the the rods uh, the pipes and you find that actually they don't make uh, any particular sound and then you have to work out why is it that's happening and then you you know realize that there is an importance to this felt you see this felt cloth uh, unless you have this uh, and you actually have to have felt even under the the wooden stand uh, unless you isolate the vibrations from the rest of the structure you won't actually get um, uh, you know proper resonating sounds because you have to rest these rods at the nodes which don't vibrate and every place else in this uh, in this rod actually is vibrating it's only here where it is touching this is that where it is not vibrating now it's quite interesting that when you uh, try to put the frequency okay you can measure the frequency by the way these days you have a uh, telephone or mobile phone apps uh, which can measure the frequency of these uh, um uh, sounds which you can play and uh, and then you can note down the frequency and you can try to plot it against the length now initially uh, the two girls who did this experiment uh, they were quite surprised that uh, for uh, for flutes uh, you know you always find that the frequency is inversely proportional to the length okay uh, for pipes uh, which have vibrating air columns you have frequency inversely proportional to the length but in this case they simply could not get a straight line if they plotted frequency versus 1 by l and so i said to them uh, why don't you try plotting against 1 by l cube 1 by l squared 1 by l raised to 4 1 by square root of l so uh, they patiently tried a few of these and what they found is that it actually does become a straight line if you plot it against 1 by l squared okay so so the theory of this is too complex to teach in school but it is a fact later on i shared with them a research paper which actually shows that when it is the solid structure of a uh, of a pipe which is vibrating then indeed you do get the frequency inversely proportional to length squared uh, it is only when there is the air vibrating inside that it is inversely proportional to the um to the length okay so so the two different the phenomena are different and and in this little exercise the students were able to go beyond uh, what would normally be taught in school uh, they felt enriched and um, i felt satisfaction for it also so so this is another example 
Um, uh, by the way, you know, it is quite instructive when you are doing these sort of projects to, uh, to urge students to make them of good finish, you know, so uh, use, um, you know, make accurate wood blocks, uh, make them elegant, polish them well, uh, and things like that. So, so it shouldn't become only just a demonstration of sound. It's actually much more than that. Um, yeah, one more example. Uh, this time it's uh, a class nine project. And uh, this project, the, the motive was to do something to do with chemistry. And, uh, uh, you know, we did this uh, at our design center at Rishi Valley. So, so obviously there is chemistry involved in making soap. And uh, once you have um, understood the reactions, uh, you then have to look at the effects of various kinds of oils on, on skin and on hair. Uh, these students particularly were motivated by trying to get rid of shampoo bottles from the campus. And uh, they wanted to make something which doesn't require a bottle but still can wash hair. So, which basically means it's a solid shampoo or a, or a soap bar. And, and uh, so they experimented with different combinations of oil and uh, finally came to a point where, you know, after a lot of samples were handed out and feedback was taken um, from students, they finally settled for a particular ratio of oils. Uh, there were five oils, uh, sunflower, coconut oil, neem oil, um, uh, rice bran oil and uh, olive oil. So there were these five oils, and uh, these are oils which we are able to get very easily from our own dining hall. And uh, by the way, this soap was meant to be only for uh, making by students and using uh, only within the campus. So it's not a commercial venture. It's purely just for our own use in the campus. So so, so the soap was finally made. It, was, uh, it turned out to be good. Uh, now, the other thing was, how do you package it? And so they wanted to use the minimum amount of paper. They didn't want to use plastic. And so we figured out that to wrap a square shape in the minimum amount of paper, uh, there is a way to do it if all the diagonals are, you know, meet like triangles here. Okay. So the only place where you have double layers of paper is here actually. Okay, here and here. Uh, here is where paper actually meets paper. Everywhere else, paper is touching only soap. So you don't have much overlap. So this turns out to be uh, a good sort of a origami exercise. And you have to be able to do this fast if you want to pack lots of soap. And then we started the production process. Um, students started making it. And uh, then we needed to find out what is our demand? You know, how many people actually want to use this? So we had to do surveys. Okay, so there is a bit of economics to learn in this. Uh, how do you estimate supply and demand for something which needs to be dried over a month. Okay, so this soap is left out to dry. It needs curing. And the curing process is about four weeks. So you have to make it in advance before you are able to offer it to people. And so that it leads to this uh, complexity in how do you know the demand four weeks from now? And so you have to find out a way to survey with people. And we did that. And now, of course, it's, uh, it's a steady process. We know how much we use. It's a popular soap uh, on the campus. Um, there was also a, a small sort of a packaging design um, exercise. And, uh, you know, it was given a name and, and a cover. Okay, so all of that is part of it. Um, the next example I have is of uh, this harmonograph. Um, so this is a class 10 students work. And uh, this time uh, what's been done here is that there is this table and through the table, there are holes here in three places and there are pendulums which are hanging. Okay. These are uh, quite long. They might be uh, a little over a meter actually. Okay. So these pendulums are hanging and they can oscillate in different directions. So this one, for example, I think it oscillates that way. Um, this one oscillates this way. And then this one, uh, the third one can actually oscillate in two directions. It's got a very interesting mount over here. And then there is this uh, board which contains uh, on its top, it contains paper. And then there are these two arms which are gently lowered onto this paper. 
and there is a pen which is stuck on this joint and it makes beautiful drawings depending on the um, the period of oscillation of these pendulums. Now, uh, all students of physics in class 10, 11, they know that the longer the pendulum, the higher its uh, period of oscillation. Okay, so you can adjust these weights to move top and uh, you know up and down, and you can adjust the ratios of these um, um, oscillation periods. And for different ratios, you get uh, absolutely different um, you know, uh, results on this paper. Uh, this is uh, just one example, but then the student who made this uh, had some uh, 20 odd different combinations and each one, uh, uh, you know, uh, extremely beautiful or, uh, uh, you know, uh, intriguing. Um, incidentally, you can simulate this exercise on a computer uh, and you can uh, reproduce these same patterns on a computer also, but this has been done mechanically. And it's not an easy task to make this sort of um, apparatus because uh, any little bit of friction will basically mean that the pen will come to a halt very quickly. So, so all these joints, wherever there is contact, and even uh, you know, even here there is a joint. Uh, I hope you can see where my mouse is, but even here there is a joint. And these joints were made out of uh, magnets because uh, that seemed like the, you know, the uh, simplest way to create a frictionless joint. So there are neodymium magnets here. Uh, these joints are actually just uh, nails which are resting on uh, a surface of steel. So there is, um, uh, it's a pivot uh, with very little contact. So, so this is, uh, again, you know, this is a, an integration where math, uh, physics, craft, maybe art, all come together. And uh, uh, this, act, this project was actually presented as an art and craft project by the student uh, for their board exam uh, evaluation. It was not presented as a physics project. It was an art and craft project. Uh, I'm going to move on to one more example. Um, this is uh, again from class 11. So, this time, uh, the, uh, you see, we teach Newton's laws uh, in class 11 and we teach gravitation. And uh, on the lower right corner, you'll see the law of gravitation. Um, there is a constant here, G. This is the gravitational force. And we say that the gravitational force depends on the mass of the two objects. If one of them is the Earth, then we are really looking at the Earth's pull on our object of mass M and it depends on the radius uh, or distance of the object from the center of the earth, okay? So, so this is what we teach in class 11, but the question is, how did Newton come up with this? Okay. So it's not purely a question of knowing this law. It's, it's um, you know, Newton is famous for saying that whatever he has done is, uh, has been possible because he stood on the shoulders of giants, but who were these giants? Okay, and if you dig into history, um, uh, it's actually 2000 years old. Uh, Aristarchus was the person who around 250 BC was trying to estimate how far the moon is from the earth. Okay, and he did this in a very interesting way. He looked at um, the eclipse data. Okay, so he looked at how long an eclipse lasts. So, so if you notice this diagram, these are the rays of the sun and the rays of the sun are producing a shadow, and this is the shadow of the earth, okay? And the moon has to pass through this shadow during an eclipse. So obviously there is a start of the eclipse, and then there is an end of the eclipse when the moon has gone through the earth's shadow. Now, if the moon was farther away than it is shown on this diagram, then it would take less time to pass through the shadow because there is less shadow, okay? And in fact, if it goes beyond this point, um, the moon is not going to be in the shadow. So, so the, the, the duration of an eclipse can tell you how far the moon is from the earth. Now imagine 2000 years ago, there is a person trying to figure this out, okay? And, um, and there are more calculations involved, which I won't go into now, but so, so the challenge I gave to these students was, can you figure out how far the moon is from the earth? Uh, doing exactly what Aristarchus did, okay? 
um, you can take a look at some eclipse data, how long eclipses last, and you can measure what is called the angular size of the sun, which is basically this angle or this angle. Okay, you can measure this just using a marble and uh, watching how um, what angle it makes uh, with the Earth when its shadow becomes nearly a point. Okay, so that's possible to do. And then I asked them um, to find out the radius of the Earth. Eratosthenes did this in 200 BC. Um, can we have students do it today? Okay. And uh, interestingly, it is possible. So how is it done? Uh, this diagram shows the rays of the sun. And this is the Earth. Okay. And if you are at Rishi Valley, let's say here, then the sun's rays make a certain angle um, with any vertical pole that you have at Rishi Valley. Now, let's say somebody has a vertical pole sticking into the ground at Hyderabad, which is 500 kilometers north of Rishi Valley. Okay. Now, that pole will make a different angle with the sun's rays. So, obviously, you can use shadows of this pole and you can figure out this angle. Okay. Only thing is you cannot be in two places at one time. So fortunately for this student, um, uh, she was in Rishi Valley and her father was in Hyderabad. And Hyderabad happens to be, you know, like I said, 500 kilometers north of where we were. And um, we had the father-daughter duo uh, do this experiment simultaneously and record you know, the size of shadows and figure out this angle. Now, if you know this angle, you know that this angle represents how much distance there is uh, or what fraction of the circumference of the Earth is captured by this the, the difference of these two angles. And if you can figure that out, you can actually figure out that if, you know, uh, uh, if this arc is represented by the difference of these two angles, then 360 degrees would be the circumference of the Earth. And from that, you get the circumference. So this is what Eratosthenes did, and this is what the students did, and they found out the circumference of the Earth. Now, um, now they went on to Newton's experiment, uh, or rather Newton's calculation. And Newton basically made the statement that if you took the acceleration of the moon, which basically depends on this radius, by the way, okay, you know the period of the moon. It's already known. It's 28 days. So. So if you use the period of the moon and the distance of the moon, you can actually find out um, what the acceleration of the moon is towards the Earth. So Newton divided that acceleration with the acceleration of any object on the surface of the Earth, which we call g normally in physics. Okay? And he said that this ratio turns out to be proportional to the inverse square of the distances. Okay, So it's equal to the distance, radius of the Earth squared divided by the distance to the moon squared. Okay, So this is what Newton actually discovered. This is the calculation he had done. And up to this, it was basically a sensory and mathematical exercise. He wasn't, at this point at least, making a theory. The theory begins here. Here, Newton is saying that there is a force which is producing the acceleration of the moon and it is the same kind of force which is producing the acceleration of any object that is on the surface of the Earth. So, for example, if there's an apple which is falling with this acceleration, the cause of that acceleration is the same as the cause for the moon's acceleration towards the Earth. Okay. So, here, Newton is ascribing a cause to those accelerations. Okay. Now, anybody can redo these observations. Anyone can do this calculation they will get nearly the same answer depending on how accurately they do the calculations and the measurements. But it is here that people can differ. For example, Einstein had a somewhat different explanation for, for uh, the acceleration of, of the moon and of any apple or any object on the surface of the Earth. And, and he differed in terms of talking about space-time curvature. But you see, it is in this abstract realm that those differences appear, not in the others. So it's important for students to know where the sensory and math end and where the abstract begins. Okay. So that's, that's basically the reason I wanted to share this uh, example. Um, this is my last example and then I'll uh, close. Um, you know, we can, uh, I, I just have a few more points to make and then we can discuss. 
this is uh, essentially it's a wood fired clay oven um, so it's a simple looking structure but there is a lot inside uh, the bottom or the base has bottles uh, to act as insulators okay this has been made with a mixture of clay and straw um, this structure uh, has been uh, made by piling that same uh, mixture of clay and straw slowly and um, an interesting thing is that to start off this exercise you start piling up the uh, the mud over uh, a straw basket okay. and uh, once main ja rahi hu sir theek hai subah aa jaungi main jaldi i'm sorry is there a okay yeah so um, so you start with a straw basket inside and when you fire the oven for the very first time you're basically going to put in a burning wood inside okay so burning pieces of wood you put them inside and and what happens is very interesting the basket the straw basket gets burnt from inside and it bakes the oven first and the inner wall of the oven becomes hard okay and the more you use this oven the longer lasting it becomes so this oven is still here it's after 3 more than 3 years i think and uh, and only the outer layers have eroded because of rain and sun um uh, and it can be easily repaired but it's still quite a uh, intact oven uh now the interesting thing is that we don't finish at just the craft of making an oven um, there is more to it so there was there is a thermocouple here uh, which was used to test how this oven cools so you start it off at a very high temperature and then it cools with time okay so so let's say you started it off here which is i think roughly 250 degrees c or so and then you watch how it uh, slow as you know it cools down and these are plotted on a log scale on the y axis and it is found that you know first the the cooling is quite fast and and then in between you know so pizza was kept in the first round and after the pizza was taken out obviously there was a big dip in temperature because the door was open to take out the pizza and then um you have to use the heat which is available so you can now put in bread and then when the bread is baked you can again open it and there's again a drop in temperature uh you can cook vegetables after that and in the very last one uh, after you've taken the vegetables out uh, you now have some heat left and you can heat water or milk or whatever you like uh, so so the interesting thing here is that there is a law that we teach students in class 11 it's called newton's law of cooling and these curves actually verify that you do expect according to that law that if you plotted the temperature on a log scale and the time on the x axis you do expect straight lines and uh, we see that uh, the other interesting thing is that there is a lot of learning here about what we do with ovens you know the the graph on the right hand side is actually quite useful for uh, a baker um uh, you see there is also reasoning here uh, because a pizza is thin um, you can actually cook it at very high temperatures because the heat can reach inside quite fast whereas bread loaves are thick so you shouldn't use very high temperatures otherwise the outside will be burnt even before the inside gets baked so bread is baked at a lower temperature than pizza okay so so there is a lot to learn from this graph which goes beyond physics and um, and it goes into practical life so uh, these were my examples i uh, uh, i think uh, Uh, i just want to summarize what you know i've been trying to share uh, these are like i said these are experiences uh, but you know there are tremendous possibilities to enrich science education uh, i'm sure uh, those of you who have been trying these things have your own examples to share and it's always wonderful to um, to have that sort of a sharing amongst teachers um, uh, you know wh why are we doing this it's it's in the hope that these individuals uh, will not only be uh you know uh, people who can grasp these subjects uh intellectually but they are engaged more fully you know with their heads hearts and hands um that they are uh, you know they they have the confidence that they can actually make things 
Uh, in fact, I hope that some of them will become entrepreneurs and make things in their lives. Uh, something which I wish I could have done uh, more and more. And uh, um, you know, uh, also the other thing is to be able to to see their connections with the world, to to actually have awareness of what is around them and not work uh, in in isolation. Um, but this does require uh, of the teacher uh, a very uh, sort of a creative thinking, uh, versatility, and the will to collaborate with others. Uh, when one must remember that you know it is not a, a sole person's uh, endeavor. In fact, many times into my own classes, I have called other teachers, and it's always been enriching to have a history teacher or a geography teacher uh, in my physics classes. Um, to talk about their, you know, something which is allied um, to what I am talking about, but nevertheless not really just physics. Um, and uh, this does require making space and time in the schools. Um, you know, if children don't have leisure to draw, for example, uh, they will tend to quickly make two-dimensional line diagrams. Uh, they won't endeavor to make three-dimensional figures. Um, so, so starting from that very simple example, uh, you can see that you know there is a need to make space and time for these things. Uh, some amount of tools are required, but it's not so much that one should feel daunted by it. Um, I want to share a couple of implications. Uh, Madhumita said that you know uh, I have to live up to my promise of talking about the JEE and and uh, similar selection processes, but uh, let me approach it this way. Um, First of all, um, should this sort of integrated approach of enriching uh, education continue into college? Okay, and uh, many of you are uh, at a college, so this is a question that we should explore together. You know, um, should this continue this sort of uh, trend in education into college? And the other thing is that you might have noticed I shared uh, no examples from class 12. And uh, the reason particularly is that in class 12, students are either thinking about their board exams or about other exams um, for their uh, selection into colleges. So, so there is a shortage of time. Uh, we try, it's not that there are absolutely no examples, but it's very difficult um, because they are faced with um, getting into colleges. And uh, many times, there is no space uh, to express a creative talent uh, or any this you know any uh, richer learning than you know purely the subjects that are tested. So so this is the question I want to you know raise about uh, selection processes that can we have uh, a creative component in these selection exams uh, so that we can make space for children who um, who have you know developed that side of themselves. And uh, I can tell you that there is a certain advantage to it, especially in a, a time of pandemic like we are right now. Um, you see, um, it's, uh, it's very hard to do a home-based exam or selection or test if there's no comp uh, you know, creative component. But on the other hand, if you um, had an exam which had at least some portion, uh, which was about what have you made, uh, what problems have you solved, um, can you solve this problem in the next two days and upload your solution? If there were such components, uh, they could be done more easily at home because uh, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, you know, the integrity of the solution that much because it's a creative solution. It will differ from student to student. You know, there is a certain amount of their individuality which is represented. Uh, so, so this is what I want to say that um, you know, it, can we think in this direction so that, so that you know, uh, science and technology, even in the college years, continues to be enriched. Uh, I personally feel, you know, I am an engineer by training, and uh, I personally feel that uh, creativity, problem solving, are are crucial to the engineering uh, discipline also uh, as a profession. Uh, I used to carry color pencils in my pocket, might be the one of the few engineers who used to do that, but somehow I felt uh, in my career that uh, color always added something to whatever I was trying to express. So, so these are implications beyond school years. Uh, I will uh, offer these for discussions and more questions, but there is one point which I want to 
um, uh, make before I wind up. Um, you see, this is um, um, this is a question about human values, and uh, the reason I bring this up is that uh, whether it's a school or college, uh, I think we cannot be shy about um, this question anymore. I think we should be thinking, talking about, um, you know, does this, does the teaching of subjects creatively uh, integrating them in all sorts of ways, does that really lead to a good human being also? Okay, so what about goodness? What about values? And um, um, I, I know that in colleges, especially, there are forums to have these discussions. I remember my days at IIT Delhi, uh, there were several teacher groups and student groups who were uh, talking about this. Um, but I feel that schools need to do a little more in this. And there can always be done uh, more done in colleges as well. Um, but I think it's a relevant question. And uh, if, you know, I, I've made a metaphorical diagram here, but if you ask me, where is the place for human values? Um, this is how I would express it. Okay, I don't know if you saw what changed, but a lot of things changed uh, in the diagram. I basically feel that values are um, beyond the theory. They uh, are a result of experience and uh, um, they are, you know, so they are at the very apex. And uh, I think values are not just another subject which can be taught. Values must penetrate all of the subjects, which is why I've colored all these green. Um, so the intention was to show that, you know, if earlier you were looking at a tree, um, then the values are the life in the tree. It is everywhere in the tree. Without those values, uh, the tree is just wood and uh, not a tree, not a living tree. So, so I think what we are really asking is that, um, can we have uh, you know, good discussions about values? What is it that brings us together? Okay. I am not talking about uh, any particular um, uh, you know, religion or any such thing. I'm asking what brings us together as human beings? You know, what will make us collaborate and work together? Um, and, and those questions uh, apply to not only our own behavior. I mean, not only do we expect teachers uh, you know, to have a certain kind of uh, conduct, but these uh, values can penetrate all subjects. Um, what should we teach in economics? Um, you know, what should we teach in history, music, sociology? So, so this is a huge question which uh, needs to be explored. Um, so with this, I'm going to come to an end with talking and uh, uh, open up for questions, comments and discussion. Okay, I've stopped sharing. It's thank you so much, Atul. Um, over to Manish. Manish, you need to unmute. Yeah. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Atul, thank you so much. Um, I guess uh, I was completely, uh, you know, I remember the time when we visited Orville together. Uh, yes. A bunch of us, four of us and four of you in that, uh, you know, the car of ours and we spent two days there uh, looking at the solar oven. Solar kitchen is what Oroville, uh, you know, has and, and the, uh, you know, this place which could do uh, wood fired pizza uh, similar to the oven that we made. So yes. I might have, have lots of, uh, um, not, not questions, but, you know, very, very thought provoking uh, talk. Um, of course, the experiments that you showed, uh, some of the, uh, those are something that we have, uh, you know, done in our lab so on and so forth. But, um, you know, the questions towards your end uh, and some things that you alluded to are something that so much resonate, of course, uh, given that, uh, you know, we were sort of uh, exploring this alternate journey together while we were in Bangalore and the parts yes. I was, you moved up a little bit up north, I moved maybe 500 more kilometers up north. And uh, um, but really it's interesting, you know, it just reminds me of all the discussions, overnight discussions we would have about really what is it, what 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 brings meaning, what what brings, you know, the things that you were talking about in the end. And and some things that maybe you didn't didn't say or you didn't want to, but to me, this question is always, always extremely important. What what is this science for? I mean, why? 
why science or why physics um and if i can just add this and then have uh, you know people participate and have the discussion um you know people associate science with technology and then technology with the, if i can can i can say convenience convenience with consumption you know um you know and so on and so forth which then leads to whatever issues that it leads to some of which we see today and that will need us to explore go back to science and sort of uh, uh, and this is a very loose um you know uh, sort of a cycle that i'm trying to make but essentially the in my opinion, in my mind this question is very uh, of paramount importance why, why and for whom and and for what purpose i i think that is something that needs to be discussed uh, and stories around that should should happen in you know schools colleges uh, and so on and so forth so um and then i had this other um, uh something that you alluded to um you know in terms of uh, uh, you know giving time um you know uh, giving space for children to reflect to observe and then to make you know whatever they want, you know draw their own conclusions and so on and so forth um and you also mentioned that in class 12 you know you you couldn't do much of that given that the, you know children have to prepare i see um more of this if i can call it malaise uh seeping down right i was just uh, visiting my um, uh, nephew and niece in the us and i, I realized their their class 11 and 12 even though they do not have this joint and en entrance exam i mean they are even more if i can use that word uh, s word uh, right i mean you know um, so it's because it is so in insanely uh, you will have to you have to uh, b and a in uh, uh, so you have to do voluntary work and you have to get an a you have to do community work you have to get an a you have to do uh, advanced aps which means college stuff and so anyways what i'm trying to say is that somewhere um, even in the societies that are supposedly developed i i don't really know if we have realized this value of uh, giving giving time giving uh, time to uh, you know observe or and so on and so forth so i think it's your talk was very very thought provoking i hope uh, um, you know all the faculty colleagues who are listening here um, you know maybe they have uh, you know, some something similar that's going on there in their minds and something that got provoked um, uh, so you know, i just had those two uh, questions maybe i have a couple of more but that i can uh, ask you later again so i mean i would request anybody who has um, any questions please come up i it, it was a pleasure for me when madhumita called me to uh, you know ask me to sort of it basically gives me an opportunity to speak longer i mean i could i would still be part of this uh, uh, talk even if i were not the moderator but given that i i can steal other people's time and and share my feelings in ter in terms of how how joyful this event has made me uh, given that um, atul and i you know and our families we were we were exploring you know so many ways of of making our lives more meaningful and trying various things uh, together and you know various things we tried various things didn't work out and so on and so forth and eventually um, you know we are where we are so uh, yes. thank you madhimita for giving me this opportunity to speak <laughs> and and bringing atul back uh, you know in in in, uh, in my mind in some sense right we, we, we talked about a year ago when your son was planning to go to school uh, in this year thank you so much so hey, hey, please feel free um whoever wants who have has uh, you know a, a comment or a question or, or whatever it is padish i think there's a question the comment from manasi here uh, who says i have a response to atul's open question to carry the approach forward to college students but maybe you know uh, that can uh, happen a little later after you have responded to manish probably yeah okay um so well um one thing i want to say uh, is uh, you know i feel equally fortunate manish to be uh, meeting you here and uh, yes i am equally reminded of the time we've spent talking about these things and uh, you know uh, i think it's uh, it's good to um, get back into some more collaboration on these things so 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 that's one thing uh, um now regarding the two questions you put uh, you know one is the purpose uh i believe the purpose of science is is to provide the how of things 
um, and uh, it is quite incomplete if we do not know the why of things. Um, and on the other hand, knowing the why of things is also incomplete if we don't know the how of things. Um, we live in a world, uh, we live with trees, birds, animals, human beings, minerals, all of this is around us and um, we coexist with them. How these things work, uh, you see, uh, should be, is actually a welcome thing for, for children uh, who are not even uh, exposed uh, a priority to any other purposes, you know, materialistic or whatever you may call. But even a little child is curious about the world and uh, they want to know how things work. Uh, there is a certain beauty in it. There is a certain utility in it also. So you see what has happened is because of uh, how we have been introduced to science and all the, um, the issues that go along with that, uh, we've developed some sort of an allergy um, or at least a partial allergy to, to, uh, to science. Actually, the truth is that uh, knowing the how of things is just as interesting uh, you know, as uh, it was when we were children. Um, for example, how does food get digested in our stomachs? Um, how does a money plant, how much does a money plant grow in a night? You know, um, that's an interesting question. And uh, um, you can have as much of it as appetite you have. You don't have to overfill yourself. Um, at some point, you can use some of these things. Uh, you know, what is the human body clock? So some of these things lead to something which has utility. Some of these things may not have apparent utility at the moment, but they still satisfy curiosity. Uh, I think the other part, uh, when we actually don't have much in terms of you know, the wisdom of what to do with what we know, that is where I think the issue starts. Uh, we know, you know what nuclear physics is, but what to do with it is still our choice. You know? And uh, um, how do we do science? Uh, the science process itself needs wisdom. Uh, you know, should we, for example, break things to know what's inside or should we look at them as systems? Should we see how the whole functions um, or should we break everything? You know, so there are all these questions. And uh, I think um, to the question of purpose of science, I would say curiosity and utility are both there, uh, but none of this will be complete unless we know the, our own purposes in life. Um, the second question was about time, and uh, I think uh, I think it was more of a comment, if I understand it correctly. Um, but what you're saying is that you know we de we need time for all this, and uh, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, so so how do we make that time? You see, uh, there are two ways to think about it. One is um, can we adjust the entirety of our curriculums so that the integration actually saves time for us. So for example, I know that the geography teacher teaches um, uh, about you know, the angle that the sun makes with the earth and all that, and we do it in physics also. In fact, we do an energy budget in physics, we do it in geography also. So there are some things we can just do together so we can save some time, but that is still minuscule. I think the big place is, um, is, uh, is to look at you know, why are we teaching science and to what end, you know? so can it, can we actually look at what we are doing with science? So, you know, just to give you an example with which you are all very familiar and maybe to some extent suffer some pain because of it. Uh, but, you know, you look at how many people take engineering entrance exams, uh, how many pass, and after they pass, how many actually do engineering work, um, the fraction gets smaller and smaller. And uh, you are left to wonder that, should they have gone this route? And uh, should they have made it so competitive that you have a multi-billion dollar coaching industry running, you know, so uh, just to get into colleges. So, so those are all big questions. And I think we can make time if we know where we are going with this in school. So I think that's my response. I think we are pretty much, I'm saying the same thing. I'm probably echoing, but, but let me know if there's something that you would like to respond with. Manasi probably uh, has something to say, and maybe we could sort of give her a chance to say. Manasi? Yes. Hi, uh, hi Apple. Uh, it was a very uh, interesting talk. 
and it's been circling my mind as well so just to just to let you know who i am i am uh, i am a design faculty at iit gandhinagar and i studied architecture and design and uh, why i wanted to say this is that once i went through this creative uh, uh, inputs in my college education my eyes and my mind opened a lot towards uh, how to study subjects and how to learn really and now i am in academics uh, design teaching design to uh, design students architecture students engineering students and uh, i have kind of developed uh, an understanding that there are two things that needs to be done with any level of students is what i i'm just sharing this is my understanding is one is we need to make them ask right questions so maybe the why how who where when all these this is what we use in design and that can be uh, applied to anything understanding of any subject or any problem or any system for that matter and the yes. second is then you provide with your subjects you provide them processes like you rightly said that science is a process so uh, when you ask the question then you can also ask this so that empowerment for them to understand how to solve or find answers and also maybe an understanding that everything uh, i mean it it develops uh, what do you say incrementally the understanding of human beings under, i mean it, it improves incrementally and we need to kind of push it forward and forward more and more so maybe those two are the things that i understand and it applies to even college students i mean they are still not asking why are we studying these subjects so that so these things i think need to be promoted even in college education why are we studying the subject Uh, because I, whenever i ask them they never know why they are studying the subject so yes yeah, that's, that's yes I mean. absolutely now i i fully agree with you i mean i i have not taught in a college but i have studied in two of them so i know this is how it goes um, we don't ask the purposes of why we are there and i wish we did more and more um it also applies i think to not only students but even teachers um many times i've you know asked myself why am i teaching um you know so so i, I think it's it applies to all of us what are our purposes yes yes, yes i agree yeah. thank you so much for bringing that up it is interesting atul you you bring that up um, by the way uh, we can keep on speaking so if anybody else says i will probably give that um, anybody else has any comment to make please feel free um, to unmute yourself and and come by right I see Neil Dara is here. Uh, interestingly, what happened, uh, Atul, is what we are doing right now is uh, uh, we are doing this um, very intensive uh, online workshop for teachers. Um, this is actually third in the series. So we did the first one as a pilot uh, in around May, uh, just to see how uh, you know we normally work with teachers. So. and that went very well and i am very happy to say sort of uh, that if i measure that engagement uh, and and because you were asking this question about uh, we should ask ourselves as teachers as to why we do it so um, you know the, the question that we asked in that uh, in the in the in the workshop in the first online workshop was you know how many of you have had love marriages and you know when you <laughs> ask this question it suddenly becomes very interesting everybody is looking at everybody else and thinking look you know let's see who all had love marriages and who I had arranged and and so of course one minus love marriage is the arranged marriage uh, but 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 then later on what we were saying was that so we are not asking about the marriage as a, you know uh, physically but marriage to the profession and then i think that was a very interesting um, thought and I, of course we said you don't have to give an answer but the point we are trying to communicate is is uh, 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 you know is is this um, why is it that i am teaching is extremely extremely important question for uh, everybody to Sort of think about for themselves, and you don't have to give an answer to anybody else. It's just something that yeah. you have to think about uh, for yourself. And uh, um, what I also uh, sort of saw from your uh, examples and stories, um, you know, where you uh, so this uh, this online workshop that we did, um, we sort of measured the engagement, and we we call it 150 percent engagement. You know, this was a four-hour uh, workshop every day for 12 days. and okay. it went on for 6 hours um even though the teachers were supposed to leave after 4 hours they didn't leave us and so you know every session got from 2 to 3 hours more than the face to face right? and so we thought we were later wondering what is it that happened in this online uh, mode that teachers were engaged and 
one thing that came out was something that I could see in your pictures. Um, you know, what you were trying to, you know, when you were doing something deep, you were trying to bind it to the other subjects. Your, your tree had various uh, branches and leaves. And uh, what teachers were saying is like, when you dig a deep hole, right? When you are digging deep, uh, digging a mine, what they normally do is when you dig very deep, they actually also build these side holes uh, which bring in more air from the side. Otherwise, you basically run out of oxygen. And, and so what, what was happening is that it is extremely critical, teachers said, that uh, we tie whatever we are teaching to these other, so basically making these subject boundary uh, a little porous, if, if, if I may say. Or, you know, whenever you talked about anything, there was either art attached to it or chemistry was with economics and so on and so forth. And that is exactly what makes it, uh, you know, that makes the subject engaging. So uh, thank you yeah, for sharing, uh, you know, those examples. Uh, you know, we also, of course, did the whole and, and Yes, yes. I'm very curious to, uh, oh, oh, you know, what you are doing also at the Center for Creative Learning. So, so maybe we can uh, spill that over to another, another time. Um, but uh, I just uh, want to share something, you know, very related to what you just mentioned. Um, see, the thing is that uh, we need more places, uh, venues where we can open our hearts and talk very, very honestly about what we are doing, why we are doing it. Um, that sort of, uh, you know, there is a need for going beyond uh, the so-called professional relation and, and bringing it uh, into a colleagueship, which, which is a colleagueship of purpose. Yes. Sorry. Yes. So, so that's what we need. Actually, we, you know, we are, we have joined hands in a certain purpose. We are uh, trying to achieve uh, a very crucial task. You know, and and so, so we need to be together in this. And I think more uh, forums where we can talk without inhibitions, without fears. Uh, is uh, is going to only be better because we learn a lot from each other and then we'll be able to do things together. Uh, I think this somewhat addresses the question that was asked previously. I hope it does, but if I missed, uh, please bring it up again. Uh, I'm not sure who it was, but somebody had asked something. Uh, may, I, may I ask uh, or may yes. rather make a comment? Okay, so this is internet here. Uh, we have had some discussions, in fact, with Manish, also with you, if you remember, but yes. that never crossed the <laughs> informal stage that can we not uh, organize a kind of a exam first at a small scale, which has this creative component in it, as you have just uh, mentioned in your talk. And interesting enough, this, uh, this is a very old talent search examination called Jagadish Bosch National Science Talent Search Examination. In short, it is called JBNSTS. And uh, that is uh, open only for the Eastern region uh, of India. I mean, the students who have passed 12th standard or who are studying in the 12th standard, they are only allowed to participate. And this exam has three rounds. So first a written examination and uh, the selected candidates are uh, then called for an interview. And finally, they just appear for a day and spend the night and it's an open book examination for them. So not an examination, I'm sorry. I mean, I put it uh, in, a, in, a, in a wrong way. So it's some, a bunch of questions are uh, suggested. They have to just uh, choose one and then work overnight to get a solution. Okay, so more or less along the same line. And this has been going on for last several years and going on very, very successfully. So uh, maybe uh, we should uh, sit and think and then actually uh, execute and think of some, uh, some such examination in a small scale to begin with some particular region of India. So uh, moving along the line of uh, this JBNSTS or we can add some more components to it, something like actually building um, uh, building a machine or building um, or doing a drawing which is sort of innovative in nature. I mean, just uh, I thought that I would share my thoughts with you. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, it's, uh, you see, it's definitely something we should explore. Um, the, the reason I say that is, you know, uh, sometimes there is a tendency to become uh, sort of idealistic and uh, uh, start thinking that we need a complete revamp of things. Uh, we probably do, uh, but the fact is that moving in small steps uh, can eventually lead us there. Uh, trying to take one giant leap 
leap um, might basically mean that we never start. So, um, so I'm I'm fully uh, you know aligned with that sort of thinking. That let's take small steps. Um, see, the question we should ask ourselves is, am I doing today what I can do today? You know, um, and uh, if I if I try the easiest thing that is possible for me. You know, then I will have the possibility of doing something uh, even more tomorrow. So, so let's say we start with something like the JBNSTS. Um, we propose something more creative. You know, and slowly, slowly, maybe we come to a point where, um, uh, you know, whether it happens in our lifetime or not, but we might come to a point where, uh, you know, the very purpose for which someone becomes an engineer or someone teaches engineering, all of those get aligned. You know, then we actually, we can have a long-term vision to it, but it's, it's good Absolutely. to start with small steps. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, uh, interestingly, Indranath, um, uh, recently Rajesh Gopakumar visited. Oh, you were there in the talk, yeah. Um, uh, yes. The ICTS, uh, uh, director. Um, so he is actually very interested in starting this Berkeley Math Circle kind of a program in India. He's very. Yeah. Uh, they are very popular in the U.S. Started in Berkeley, uh, but very popular in the U.S. So every region has these uh, very informal uh, people who are generally interested in um, kids who are generally interested in math. Uh, we mm -hmm. get together on a Sunday and then you know just discuss uh, interesting things like some of those things that Atul showed. Um, and and then you know things start and and the curriculum is already in some sense laid out so not much so we should sort of definitely uh, take cues from all of those things and and, and start uh, sure i quite agree yeah 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 i think this is uh, like a starting point i think that you know uh, it's good that some of us are meeting uh, for the second time but there are so many new people and uh, for whoever is interested i think uh, it would be so nice to actually continue, uh, you know, working on these this theme of enrichment of purpose. So, yeah, let's see how we can format that. Let's see how we can work together. At the moment, I think everybody has to work over the internet, no matter whether they are in the same <laughs> geographic region or not. So, so we can start. <laughs>